So this is a very different situation for me. Normally, as you know, I like to get guests on and interview them and use it for my own selfish personal needs for understanding who they are and what it is that they do. This one is different. This is where I've been talking to a, a lecturer at the University of South Wales called Michael Bates. And I've been working with Michael now for a couple of years where I've been um, giving a guest lecture to his, uh, his university course, uh, which is looking at the human factors within, um, within ma uh, aircraft maintenance. And he suggested that he could, he, he was good friends with uh, Gordon DuPont, who is, as we many of you either know or you're about to find out, is the author of what they call the Dirty Dozen, um, which looks at, you know, the causes of, of mistakes, really, hu human error in, particularly within the aviation sector, but actually is translatable much wider. But then when Michael suggested this, this to me, that he could, um, we could do a, an interview with Gordon and, and find out a bit more about him. I, I took the, the bold step, well, bold for me, those of you that, uh, that know I'm a bit of a bit of a control freak when it comes to this type of thing, that, um, I said, well, why doesn't he do the interview? I could sit in the background and make, you know, make the magic happen, make, uh, produce it, but he could use the, uh, this platform to do the interview. And, the main drive behind that was he's going to use this interview as part of his um, part of his lecturing course, uh, which I think is brilliant. It's a great use of, of this platform for doing some good. And then I decided I, I would just step back, let them get on with it. And then they were both generous enough to let me use it for uh, for this podcast episode. So without further ado, I'm going to disappear. I'm going to go and put my feet up and leave you in the capable hands of Michael Bates interviewing Gordon DuPont. Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, technology. and particularly the bit in between. Hi, my name is Michael Bates and I'm the lead for the Human Factor Train at the University of South Wales. I became a module leader in 2016 and quickly realised that the two main people in the introduction of human factors in aircraft maintenance and often referred to in the module nine notes for the Yasser and the CAA, which is part of the part 66. And part of that training were the two they were looking at were Professor James Reason, who is from the UK, and Mr. Gordon DuPont from Transport Canada. So I became, as I said, became the module leader in 2016, and I reached out to Gordon in 2017 on LinkedIn. and was very pleased that he was happy to accept my LinkedIn request and developed me developed my module and we've been friends ever since we finally met in march 2019 at the hai heli expo in atlanta georgia where i attended one of gordon's workshops and for those that don't know gordon is known as the father of the dirty dozen and he's once said to me we specialize in training aviation personnel on how to avoid the human error that they never intend to make using the dirty dozen contributing factors to human error. So I'd like to introduce, uh, bring Gordon forth now. So we're going to have a, a little chat. Hi, good afternoon and welcome, Gordon. Or good Thank morning. Thanks, I uh, appreciate it. I'm quite happy to uh, have a chat with you anytime. Uh, thank you very much for that, Gordon. So first of all, I would like to know what, what's your current role and what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I, I say that I'm retired, but and Renee, my daughter, is uh, taking over the business, but uh, I mainly write articles now. I've been doing that for a lot of years, so uh, I'll continue to do it while uh, my brain cells allow me to. And where are those articles based predominantly? Uh, they Most of the articles are going into the uh, DOM Director of Maintenance magazine. And uh, I've been writing for them since uh, 2014. Oh, very interesting. And, and obviously, we, you, yeah. think you've got your own website as well. Yes, we have a, all of the articles. Uh, after six months, they revert back to me, and so they're put onto the website at uh, system-safety.com. Uh, so there's a lot of them there. Yeah, well, and I have used a few in our training notes. Good. They're not copyrighted, yeah. so help yourself. <laughs> so how did you get involved in the human factors and ergonomics? Uh, 
I, you know, that's, it's a good question. I think when I was an accident investigator, uh, it became uh, frustrating that the uh, same accident would occur, different name, different date, different aircraft, but the same accident. And so I had to say, okay, why are these pilots making this error? And it sort of grew from there. Um, and uh, I, when I left transport can uh, uh, accident investigation, uh, it was to try and be proactive rather than reactive. Kill yourself and I'll investigate in the old days. So I thought, well, I'll try and prevent you from killing yourself. Which is a much better idea overall, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So, so can you give me a bit, bit about your avionic aviation background? Started out way back in 1960, it would have been as a missionary pilot in New Guinea. Uh, where I soon learned I wasn't bulletproof and uh, there was more than one flight where I said, Lord, if I live or die, it depends in your hands because I've run out of options <laughs> and I'm still here. So he listened. <laughs> so, and, uh, the neck line between you and uh, God then. Oh yeah, great trust in, uh, in the Lord for sure. Uh, but I, I came back, I got involved with um, doing um, uh, of social work uh, for the uh, Catholic missions and sort of went on from there. I had my own business for a while and um, ended up uh, working for major airlines as a maintenance person. Uh, and uh, from there, I was a principal of a training school for maintenance and uh, sort of decided I'll go out on my own and uh, I've done that since 1999. It's been a fantastic ride. <laughs> yeah. So were you a maintenance engineer before you started flying or was it the other? No, engineer? no, I started flying first. And on one particular flight where I took a great more interest in uh, maintenance was I flew a uh, Cessna 185 for, I guess it was about a three and a half hour flight uh, across New Guinea landed the thing, taxied and shut her down and the oil poured out of the uh, bottom of the cowling. The plug finally fell out, but, but the whole belly of the airplane was covered in oil. So I would have had probably more five more minutes to live. So somebody upstairs was looking after me. Definitely. So that made you think about becoming an aircraft maintenance engineer as well? Oh, you bet. I had a lot more interest in the maintenance of the aircraft after that. I'm assuming you did that under the FAA regulations. Well, no, this was in New Guinea when this yeah. occurred. And so it would have been the Australian. Uh, and there was, and they didn't do much regulation at all in New Guinea. You are more or less on your own. Oh, so you, you were an unregulated. Yeah. There were regulations, but nobody to enforce them. So <laughs> it's like a speed limit. Everybody drives. from those early years in New Guinea that you'd like to discuss? Uh, well, you know, flying in New Guinea was um, well, where you learn that you're not bulletproof, for one thing. I mean, there was quite a few times where I said, Lord, if I live or die in your hands, because I've run out of options. It literally uh, flying with a seat in your pants. Yeah, exactly. He always came through and there was a river that I'd recognized and now I knew where I was. And uh, that was the days before GPS. People have it real easy nowadays. Compared well, I imagine to there's not much to follow in Papua New, New Guinea. A lot of it's forested, isn't it? Pardon me? Say again? I said, I don't suppose there's a lot of uh, landmarks in Papua New Guinea to follow if you're flying yeah. without... Uh, there's navigation. a lot of jungle. And yeah. that jungle looks so much the same. There wasn't even a hill. A river was a, you know, we found the river, you were in good shape. I actually used to deliberately put an air in my heading so that I hit the river and I'd know which direction to fly. An interesting way of carrying up maintenance. Yeah. So you got, you got the best dog there then. I got a background audience here. <laughs> Uh, I think 
I think she heard something. So, so what's been your career path from, from the beginning then? So you were a pilot first, then you became an engineer. Or so. Yeah, I was a pilot first. Um, I, well, but you didn't just fly. Of course, when you worked in a mission, uh, flying was a small part of it. I was a trainer, a teacher, and that. I think I might have to put that dog out. No, she's quiet. <laughs> uh, Chantel. Um, so uh, you did. A, I was trainer basically, and you flew when you when you needed to fly. But I had to first build the airstrip, uh, and that, and we the mission was donated an aircraft, and I was chosen to be the pilot. I guess because I was the youngest one there, and I soon learned I wasn't bulletproof. Excuse me, I'm going to put a certain dog out the door. Okay. Hey. There we go. Be even more annoyed now. You've locked him out. Yeah, <laughs> she's locked out. <laughs> uh, so, um, where exactly where were we? I mean, I, mean, uh, I think you, you were just discussing Papua New Guinea and the things you've done then. And then, uh, did you go back to Canada at that point? Yes. Yeah. I, I, you did a lot of things besides fly, of course, in the mission. It was, uh, I was injured. Uh, hauling uh, logs out with a little tractor uh, a breakdown in communication between me and the native and i ended up with a broken arm that was badly smashed so i came out of new guinea with the intent to go back and i said if i go back i want to have be able to maintain that aircraft as well as fly it and so they arranged for me to take training with the christian brothers out of chicago and uh, then I ended up getting married and they had no provision for married people in the missions. And so it took a different turn. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's uh, like what it does. Yeah. So uh, from there, um, I ended up uh, working for a major, well, smaller company and then major airlines and then went from that to accident investigation to Transport Canada. Because accident investigation is very reactive. Get yourself killed and I'll investigate and tell the world, you know, the human factors, why you killed yourself. And I said, I'd kind of like to prevent them from killing themselves in the first place. So uh, I jumped over to Transport Canada. And from there, I became so what my... Transport Canada, were you in charge of the human factors? Well, we didn't have human factors uh, to per se at uh, Transport Canada. Uh, we were, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, ministers delegate, that was it, to accidents. So um, I was trying to bring in more human factors rather than pilot air in the story. Uh, there. What's up about the Dirty Dozen? Yeah, the Dirty Dozen was developed because. Uh, with well working with Transport Canada. Because one of the things I said is we got to train, particularly maintenance people. The pi there was CRM for pilots, but nothing for maintenance people. Yeah. So I developed the human performance and maintenance. I said, I'm not, they wanted me to call it MRM. And I said, no, it sounds like it's the same thing with a different <laughs> letter. So I call it human performance and maintenance. So within transport, I developed the workshops that we do today. I believe you took one, so. Yeah, so was your focus on the maintenance aspect or do you look at the Dirty Dozen from a pilot perspective as well? Oh, I focused on maintenance. I, 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 when I came back, I had a lot more interest in maintenance after the oil plug fell out of the airplane <laughs> on landing. You must have been quite a forerunner in that field then because meant not many people were looking at it from a maintenance perspective. They were more looking at it from, I believe, from a pilot, co-pilot, air traffic control sort of side. Yeah. Well, I used to think of flying as bo hours of boredom with moments of sheer terror. Uh, <laughs> so, I found there was more of a challenge, believe it or not, in maintenance, of course. Yeah, well, I, can, I concur with that, being in the yeah, so, I'm having worked in, in areas similar to Papua New Guinea. Right. Yeah. Where right. human error is often largely ignored. Yeah. 
yeah. and, and headhunted if you make a mistake where people tend to be laid off rather than investigation being carried out in a fair and just manner yeah they tell they in the old days it was when you made a mistake they told you be more careful yeah. that's the answer <laughs> well, uh, in my last job it was if you make a mistake there's the runway off you go yeah <laughs> yeah oh yeah that wasn't uncommon yeah so, no i uh, i'm very happy with the way uh life was able to guide me shall we say because uh, action investigation was a fantastic uh you know seven years of it but it was a lot of repetition after a while yeah just the same, the same over and over exactly change the date change the aircraft registration and location and you got the same accident so uh, that's why i left them to become more proactive you are listening to 1202 the human factors podcast we wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for your support you can help further by rating us through your podcast provider sharing us through social media and telling your friends and colleagues let's work together in raising awareness of the value in putting users at the center of what we do So can you explain what are the Dirty Dozen? We've discussed it a few times, but what, what are the Dirty Dozen? Or something? How did they come about? How did you... Sort of well, how did they come about? Oh, yeah. um, when I uh, transferred from accident to the, there, the, I said, look, I need some data uh, to base this on. The military came up with uh, boxes of this stuff with uh, printed... Uh, remember the old paper with a line uh, oh, yeah. on the side? The old printer. And folded over back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> I got boxes of this stuff. And so uh, that's one thing about the military, that at least somebody was keeping track of these things. Yeah. So I went through them. There were some that the cause of accident, carelessness. Well, it doesn't tell you anything. Uh, uh, but uh, I, from I that, I started to put down, well, what I thought some of these were. And the dirty dozen came out of that. Um, Excellent. So, so if you think about the Dirty Dozen, which would you say was the, the one that you found the most often in an accident? Or do you think they were sort of spread evenly? Well, def definitely the there's one that stands out, and that's fatigue. And mainly because people don't realize just what it's doing to you. And yeah. that, as you get more and more fatigue, you develop a don't care attitude, and that leads to accidents. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you want to sleep. So you you reach a point where you're letting things go and you don't care because you want to sleep. So definitely fatigue is number one. I mean, fatigue is almost like if somebody's drunk, isn't it? You sort of start, you start making, you know, you're very complacent. You start making mistakes. You, you And the thing is, you don't even realize that you're not doing things correctly. That's right. I always say you, you begin to develop a don't care attitude. Yeah. Something's not right. You just don't care anymore. You want to sleep. And that's the number one goal that your brain is saying. And funny uh, enough, looking through the regulations, certainly in the UK, for things that are affected by the dirty dozen, and fatigue mm -hmm. is probably the least regulated. The shift yeah. patterns and things like that are... are Quite, you know, quite often people expect you to do 12 hour shift and six hours of overtime. And, and it's right. straight because of all, of all of the dirty dozen, to me, it seems a pretty obvious one to go for. But it's exactly. the one that's legislated against the least, I think. Right. One of the worst uh, uh, um, occupations, believe it or not, is the medical field. Yeah. yeah they get an intern and he's expected to work 24 hours yeah. you know, on duty. And that, I guess that makes him a man. I don't know or a doctor. I don't want anyone working on my body that's been awake 24 hours. Uh, because of course, to Drew, uh, uh, Drew out of um, Australia, that's the equivalent of 0 0.08 alcohol. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, it's, it's really I think when, when we discuss the dirty dozen in class, we tend to talk about, usually in the order that they presented in, on your site, and number one is communication. And I think most people would feel that communication is probably the biggest issue. So it's 
it's interesting to see that you you feel fatigue is yeah higher than communication well believe it or not when i first started uh, with the training i think i spent about 20 minutes on uh, fatigue uh, today it's over an hour out of the whole course is yeah. focused on fatigue so well, I, uh, I think the industry has looked quite in depth at um, communication and you know you we all have our work orders you got to follow and your manuals you got to follow and your check sheets you got to carry out your shift diaries for the handovers mm -hmm. so i think that's pretty much been looked at and dealt with but as you say possibly fatigue to the same extent hasn't you're right it's uh I, it's starting to uh people are starting to realize uh, fatigue uh cause uh, you know can cause a lot of accidents or a lot of uh in mishaps, I think the term they like to use, where they miss things, it doesn't cause an accident, but had the potential to do so. so. Well, I think in class when we discuss um, the, the different factors of the dirty dozen, in a way they're obvious once you've looked at them. <laughs> right. Try and think of them is is quite quite a lot of work, and, and things like lack of spare parts, for instance, lack of resources, mm. lack of resources, that, yeah, that, that again. I've come across major issues where it's well we haven't got the part just can you fix it with what you've got and refit the o-ring even though it's right. broken you know yeah. once once we get it in we'll we'll change it then right yeah flat no it's flat on the, both sides but it'll still fit in. yeah <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah lack of resources in some areas i mean new guinea we had to provide make provisions all the time because there was no spare parts you know you got a battery in the back of the aircraft that's held with bailing wire <laughs> not even lock wire <laughs> as, as long as you've got botch tape or wd-40 you're okay you know the one to make that's things it. move and the one to stop them moving yeah duct tape and wd-40 yeah that's that's yeah. all you need <laughs> that's all you need <laughs> for a little while yeah i just so, yeah. we discussed a little bit about um fatigue and communication and, and lack of resources which which other ones do you think are the main causes yeah the big four out of the 12 and uh, that's the ones we actually spend the day two of the workshop are uh uh, fatigue, lack of, uh, sorry, fatigue, lack of communication, uh, lack of teamwork uh, is, a, is a big one as well, and stress. Stress. That's the four big ones. Yeah, uh, well, stress stress and pressure sort of go hand in hand, don't they? Yeah, very, yeah. Um, the, uh, pressure, pressure works, causes, yeah. creates stress. Right. Um, I, I know that from my personal experience that if the pressure builds up and builds up and it's it's important to remember it's not just in work is it? it's your family life and and all aspects of life build that pressure up and yeah. eventually that stress becomes overwhelming yeah. and i remember discussing with you a few months ago where we were talking about the bell curve that you see in all of the uh the books of the stress bell curve and yeah. i remember you saying to me it's not a bell curve at all it's it's more like in my mind i think of it like the stall curve where it gradually yep. goes up gradually goes up gradually goes up and then is almost vertical yeah and having almost having yeah. been through that i understand what you what you're saying in that it, it becomes overwhelming to a point where you just cease to function in a way yeah and that happens pretty quickly you, you you're able to function for a certain point and then it's fairly steep down it's not a bell curve by any means no and and that's something i even though i show the bell curve because that's what is expected in the syllabus i then <laughs> explain to the students that that's not actually the the shape of it at all and in fact look at this one and this right. is much more accurate so um on, on your linkedin i think you say you say you say that being an investigator with the transport safety board of canada was often frustrating and a paperwork had a bit of a political tw tinge to it. What, what did you mean by that? Well, it was never anything in writing, but there was a, a sort of an unwritten code that your job is to cover the minister's ass, is what we used to say. 
In other words, don't find the Minister of Transport guilty of being uh, one of the contributing factors. Yeah. Now, that was never in writing. And uh, But when you sent a report in for that, they would, of course, edit it and view it. And that you'd often find somebody in Ottawa would be making changes to your re your final report as an accident investigator. Uh, I had to come back to you for final approval, but you would find where if you were kind of blaming Transport Canada to some degree, uh, that uh, they'd try and get you to soften that. I think that's the same in a lot of, well, the manufacturers, the airlines, the people at the top often don't want to know. And they certainly don't want to be blamed. It's all right nope. to get rid of somebody at the bottom, the maintenance engineer. <laughs> but once it starts, once you start looking for major organizational changes, which of course are expensive, then it's a different situation, I think. Right. Yeah. Especially if you're starting to point to somebody high at the top, that's part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, uh, they, yeah. that uh, cover the minister's ass sort of comes into play. <laughs> I remember having this discussion once when I was in my previous job. They were discussing uh, the fact that BA at the time had removed the union flag from the tail and had put this wishy-washy thing in. And they were saying, you know, it's, it's almost as if they embarrassed to be British. But then I, I pointed out that the company that I worked for used to have the word British in its name and had since removed that. And I said, do, do you mean like that? And they went, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that got a bit of a, a few laughs off the attendees of the course at the time. So you said now you've retired. You're 80 now, aren't you, I believe? Well, I've I sort of semi-retired anyhow. Renee, my daughter, has taken over the business. Uh, I'll go with her and do uh, training because we always try to use two facilitators yeah <laughs> you get more across enables you to do skits which uh, varies the type of training we you know we try to focus on problem-based learning i put people into teams uh, for that so uh, in fact we're due to go down to texas and there so i'll go down with her and so there there's two so i i've retired in that she looks after all of the paperwork she looks after everything there and i tend to uh, focus on writing so, uh, so i write articles have been for a lot of years so you give her all the admin effectively but you do as a hobby yeah <laughs> that's great to be i think as i said uh, earlier I, I was on one of the training courses that you did it was only one day unfortunately but i remember that the repartee between you and rene was was very good and from that, the, the teamwork as well. I've I've taken that on board with my students where mm -hmm. I can, and try and put them into teams or at least divvy them up into small groups so that they can discuss issues. Because people, I, I find people's uh, ideas can be quite different, and if if you could pool mm -hmm. them together, sometimes you get things coming out that somebody else wouldn't have thought of. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, uh, we've always tried to use two facilitators and companies that we've trained the trainers, uh, they say, oh, it's too expensive and they go down to one. Yeah. You know, I think there's an article somewhere in my in the thing why you should use two facilitators. And then, well, I'm in that position. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're a one-man show too. One-man show, yeah. Yeah, it's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, the trouble is, that's what everything boils down to at the end of the day, including oh, yeah. safety. Yeah. So it comes down to money. And I, I just say to my students at the start of the human factors course, what, what's most important to the airline? What's the most, the number one criteria? And they all put their hand up and they say safety. And I say, no, <laughs> profit is the number one, safety is the second. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully a close second. <laughs> That's so, the best you can hope for. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Gordon. As, as you know, I'm filling in on Barry's podcast in a way, and I'm doing this also for the University of South Wales students. So it's a two-pronged sword today. And Barry has asked if there's a, he says he always asks the same three questions to anybody he interviews. 
so the, the final three are so what is your go-to book or paper that you use repeatedly in, i in would our... say james reason's book no yeah. doubt about it human factors it's called and that he's written more than one book but they yeah. uh, james reason to me is really the father of looking beyond the man yeah um I, I, well i've actually got that book as well and it's on our reading list so it's it's a fascinating book to to look at and it, was that the sort of book that you use while you were doing your aircraft in, accident investigation no um, <laughs> what were you using I, then well there wasn't one it wasn't one you know i am a, a bit of a dinosaur no. and that there was no human factors in tra in accident investigation when i was a train uh investigator so and I, I, put, yeah, if i tried to put some in they'd say you don't know what he was thinking you can't put that there and it would come out there <laughs> yeah, so, well thankfully people like you and professor james reason have pushed the boundaries certainly in aircraft I mean, obviously, the, you're not the only two now. There are quite a lot of, uh, and, and one, uh, one interesting book, I don't know if you've seen it, Gordon, is Introduction to, is that backwards? You might be backwards. No, no, that's right, yeah. Introduction to Human Factors, factors in a accident, accident Investigation by... Who, who's right? R.S. Bridger. It's don't available know. on. It's okay. a very simplistic book, and it's for, for it's good for students or people who've never come across Human Factors. Right, explains things in very layman terms, and I know you like doing that as well, so yeah, that everybody can simple. understand. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's available on Amazon, I believe. Right, that's that's yeah. one of the ones I've I've introduced to my students this year. So, one of the training courses that I was sent on with Transport Canada, there was a person that was a human factors expert, and it was a one week course, and the man never moved out from behind the podium i watched right. him was trying to say okay is he going to come out at all and he hid behind it and it was boring as hell yeah. and i thought you know that's not human factors he rattled that's on about it so i got nothing out of that whole week course that's why then, when we went through the covid and i was teaching online trying to do human factor training on a screen is incredibly difficult yeah. And I'm so pleased that my students did as well as they did at that for that particular yeah. year. Yeah. But the follow, following year, when virtually everybody was still teaching from home, I said to my manager, "I need to be in the class because you can't teach human factors online. It's it's almost impossible. And yeah. it's difficult enough, as you said, not being able to get up behind the podium because normally I'm walking around and interacting. And of course, right. during COVID, I wasn't allowed to do that. Oh, well, you're kidding! Wow. Well. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be quite pleased this year to be able to sort of integrate into the class again. Right, right. Yeah, you yeah. probably, you took the class, you know, so we put our uh, uh, desks in a semicircle. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so that you can walk to each one quite easily. You're not passing one to get to the other. Uh, and there's a re psychological reason for that. You're, you're more close to your students that way, or participants, a better term, I guess. Yeah, unfortunately, our classrooms are fairly regimented, so it's not often I'm in a position. It would take me 20 minutes to arrange it and 20 minutes to put it back, and I'd lose 40 minutes of a lesson. Yeah, I can't have that. You know. So if, but, if you could, what advice would you give your younger self going back to, if you, if you were now looking back at your... Oh, your boy, take better care of yourself, I guess. <laughs> I broke quite a few bones in my younger days. <laughs> Or fly uh, on the seat of your pants, you will. Yeah. I mean, I started out as a kid jumping off a barn with an umbrella, and I've broken more bones than I care to think about. Uh, and that because I tended to have the feeling if I'm hired to do something, then that's what I'm going to do. And that can get you killed. And just somebody upstairs said, I don't need you up here. <laughs> so uh, otherwise, I'd be dead a long time ago. And that take take better care of yourself. You know, do a little risk management before you, you know, take off and scud run you know, a flight. I certainly would say that. <laughs> and, and lastly, Barry, what was asked as well? Uh, who would you suggest he interviews for his podcast? You know, a, a, a very uh, excellent person is Bill Johnson, Doctor Bill Johnson, out of the uh, U.S. And that he he was worth transport. He's retired now, but uh, 
actually I was just talking to him the other day and uh, and I'm sure that if you were to call him I'll give you his phone number and that he'd be happy to talk to you because he did the he was the head of the human factors for the FAA all right and uh, so uh, uh, and Bill took our workshop when I came up and we became very good friends and so um, we we keep in touch so Dr. Bill Johnson, uh, yeah, right. I highly well, recommend I myself in that category because we met on one of your uh, training courses and <laughs> we've become firm friends over the years. Right, yeah, yeah. He he was with the FAA and he came up and took the workshop and uh, um, so we became good friends after that. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So is it is there anything else that you could think of that might help my students in their passion for human factors? Uh, well, you know, human factors is very, very, uh, uh, you know, pointing to the individual. I, and so often I find human factors and they're talking about the organization. To me, it's the individual, why he thinks, why he does the things he does. And so try and avoid the, uh, where this is human factors and they talk about the organization and how you got to go back to uh, make sure you got the root cause. Well, the root cause might be the organization, but don't focus on that. Focus on the human and why he did the things he did. Even if it was the root cause that caused him to do what he did. So, yeah, to me, that that's the thing. Focus on the individual. And the what thing for is, if one person makes a mistake, you can guarantee somebody else is going to make that same mistake. Yeah. Unless something's done about it. Yeah, it wasn't uncommon. You'd fire the person and hire somebody to make the same mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, the person you hire has got even less experience yeah. than the person you just sacked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the quote, I, I the think a lot of your day. videos as well, because I've got a number of your videos for my uh, my course, as you know, and a lot mm -hmm. of them look at that. You know, if you sack this guy, who are you going to get in, in in replace of them? And and quite often the manager in the videos say, "Well, you're the best guy in our team," but I got to yeah. let you go. You yeah. say, well, why are you letting Why are you letting the best person leave? It's yeah, that's it's right. Really pointless, really. Yeah, because he made a mistake. Yeah. Which proved all that proves is he was human. So we 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 humans make human errors ever since Adam and Eve went and ate that bloody apple. <laughs> it's yeah, one of my it's been a downward spiral since then. It has been, yeah. That's <laughs> one of my favorite cartoons is uh that no apple policy doesn't apply to us. <laughs> as Eve hands it to Adam. <laughs> so right. thank you very much, Gordon, for your time. And I look forward to speaking to you again sometime. My pleasure, anytime. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human, the Human Factors, Factors Podcast. Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us on social media, such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next See time. You next and time. remember, it's more than just common sense.